Um. Ok. All right. Good afternoon, dear students from the Technical University of Crete. This is the seventh lecture of the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Online course, which comprises 14 lectures in total. This course is organized by Eureka Pro and the Technical University of Crete with a valuable, valuable contribution of instructors from Eureka Pro partner universities. I'm very happy to welcome you again on our weekly meeting. Please don't forget to keep your microphone muted. By the end of the talk, we will launch an anonymous quiz and we'll, we will give you two minutes to answer the questions. Once time runs out, the statistics of the poll will be shared and the lecturer may initiate a discussion session based on your answers. Finally, as with every lecture, we will have some time for your questions and brainstorming. Please feel free to use the raise hand button after the end of the talk and post your question live, or if you don't feel comfortable with that, just post your question in the chat. Last week, Professor Knauer from the Hochschule mit Weida, University of Applied Sciences, gave us an inspired talk on different starting points to identify valid entrepreneurial opportunities. This week, I'm honored to introduce you to Mr. Moses Pinto from University of Ule, Spain. I'm happy to be here online with you all and uh, I look forward to a very fruitful uh, presentation and I hope that you can take a lot of knowledge away from uh, my explanation and presentation. So uh, Mr. Pinto, the floor is yours. You can start your presentation. Sorry. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, the introduction and for the detailed explanations. Uh, now I will start sharing my screen and then we can begin the lecture. Uh, do you see the PowerPoint presentation? Okay. So, um, welcome to the seventh lecture of the online training course uh, in innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, the topic for today is going to be entrepreneurial process and decision making. Uh, my name is Moses Pinto. I'm with the University of Lyon in Spain, and um, I will be um, presenting this lecture to you uh, in the hope that it invokes a sense of entrepreneurial spirit uh, within yourselves. So let's get on with it. The outline of the lecture is going to be as follows. First, I'm going to speak about the concept of entrepreneurship. Next, the entrepreneurial process will be explained step by step. Thereafter, decision making in entrepreneurship will be presented. Interestingly, a scientific approach to entrepreneurial decision making shall also be presented. And thereafter, we shall look into green entrepreneurship where with something called the sustainable ecopreneur. Uh, subsequently, we will also have case studies and they would in the end, uh, towards the end, we would have potential areas of improvement and discussion, which would also open the floor to um, a brainstorming session as well as a poll. And thereafter, I will also be uh, welcoming your, um, your comments and queries. So to begin with, let us look at the concept of entrepreneurship and its origins. The word entrepreneur originates from a 13th century verb, entrepreneur, meaning to do something or to undertake something. By the 16th century, the noun form entrepreneur was being used to 
mention someone who undertakes a business venture. And um, thereafter, the first academic use of the word was by an economist in, uh, by the name of Richard Cantillon, uh, who identified the willingness to bear the personal financial risk of a business venture as the defining characteristic of an entrepreneur. In the early 1800s, economist John Baptist Say popularized the word usage entrepreneur. John Baptist Say stressed the role of the entrepreneur in creating value by moving resources out of less productive areas and into more productive ones. Next, John Stuart Mill used the term entrepreneur in his popular 1848 book titled Principles of Political Economy to refer to a person who assumes both the risk and the management of a business. The key word here being risk. John Stuart Mill provided a clearer distinction than Richard Cantillon between an entrepreneur and other business owners. For instance, shareholders who assume financial risk as well, but they do not actively participate in the management of the firm. In academic works, how has the concept um, evolved? Two 20th century economists, Joseph Schumpeter and Israel Kirzner refined entrepreneurship's understanding. Schumpeter stressed the role of the entrepreneur as an innovator who implements change in an economy by introducing new goods or methods of production. That is, entrepreneur is a disruptive force in an economy. Schumpeter emphasized the beneficial process of creative destruction in which the introduction of new products resulted in the obsolescence of others. For instance, uh, you all are aware of the introduction of the compact disc or the CD as we now know it, and the corresponding disappearance of the vinyl record, which is the black lacquered um, records which used, to, uh, which used to be famous in the 1980s and they were used to play music. Kirzner, on the other hand, focused on entrepreneurship as a process of discovery. Kirzner's entrepreneur is a person who discovers previously unnoticed profit opportunities. Kirzner's entrepreneur is an equilibrating force. For instance, an entrepreneur in a college town who discovers that recent increases in college enrollment creates an opportunity to renovate houses and turn them into rental apartments. So you see that the process of discovery is when an entrepreneur finds new opportunity and he makes exploits the discovery in and turning it into an entrepreneurial venture. Thereafter, now let us look at the concept of entrepreneurship from a decision making perspective. Entrepreneurship involves phenomena and processes related to discovering, evaluating, and exploiting opportunities to create future goods and services. This was a definition by Shane and Venkatraman in the year 2000. Uh, in the year 2004, Choi and Shepard have postulated that the outcome of this process, that, that is entrepreneurship, is the emergence of new products or services or both. And a rather older vintage definition uh, given by March in the year 1991 uh, mentions that the exploitation of an opportunity refers to those activities and investments committed to gain returns from the new product arising from the opportunity through the building of efficient business systems for full scale operations. Now, this is a little bit from the decision making perspective. And we will be looking into scientific decision making in the subsequent slides. Now, the entrepreneurial process, let us look at it from a step by step basis. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to the, uh, to the graphic. Although um, it, it, is, it may seem a little bit too condensed, 
but I will run you through it uh, in a step-by-step -step manner. So step one, we have the entrepreneur himself or herself. Step two involves contacts. Step three involves opportunity and its identification. Step four is the venture. That is in that involves launching the venture, the entrepreneurial uh, venture in the form of a business. Step five involves gathering the resources in the form of capital and other kinds of funding. Step six involves the management that is looking into the day-to-day -day management. And step seven involves strategies um, towards making right and sound decisions uh, towards keeping the entrepreneurship uh, activity consistently um, going forward. Now, with regards to step one, we have um, an entrepreneur is one who brings entrepreneurship into his business. And that is what uh, gives the term entrepreneur to the business owner. And um, what does this involve in the very beginning? Well, it involves risk and risk need to be moderated. But what do entrepreneurs do? Entrepreneurs assume a moderate risk in the process of starting their own business. Then we have need achievement. What would be the motivation for an entrepreneur? An entrepreneur commences the entrepreneurial activity with the purpose of attaining a greater achievement in comparison to the traditional institutions of business and industry. So a need achievement is fulfilled through entrepreneurship. The next step is contacts. The entrepreneur plays, sorry, pays greater attention to developing business contacts and liaising with the authorities relevant to the entrepreneurial business setup. So what do we have in this next, in the second step? Firstly, an entrepreneur needs to deal with the reality of a new economy. When an entrepreneur starts a new business, he or she sees what is going on in the economy today. That is the business reality of the market and then decides what he or she needs to do. Accordingly, the entrepreneur would develop a network of valuable contacts and start making inroads by discussing his entrepreneurial uh, ideas, uh, pardon pronunciation, uh, society law, now, the next process in step two involves the laws prevalent in the society that need to be gauged and observed after the realities are seen in the first process. Without respecting the law of the society, an entrepreneur cannot start a business. Rules and regulations in the form of governmental law necessarily follow from the law of the society. Thereafter, we have step three, that is the opportunity itself. The third step in the process involves the identification of opportunities. So in a phase, we have identification of opportunities and an entrepreneur is a creative organism by their inherent nature. This is all but natural. Entrepreneurs must constantly innovate in order to evolve into profitable ventures. The whole idea of entrepreneurship being the profit motive. And to a certain smaller extent also need achievement, which we have highlighted in step one. Um, and thereafter, we have the search for an opportunity. Now, identifying an opportunity and searching an opportunity should not be interchangeably understood. Because an entrepreneur should also be able to search for new opportunities search for opportunities which lead to new ideas and then uh, provide products or services based on the opportunities that are available towards profit uh, generation. Step four involves the venture. In this step, the entrepreneur dares to plan, organize and launch the business. Now this is a crucial step and uh, it leads to the culmination of the first three steps and it also paves way for the next steps. 
So what does step four involve? Of course, you have planning. Planning is a necessary phase of the venture because uh, every entrepreneur needs to plan for the business and uh, it involves how far they want to try the business and where would they like, for instance, where would they like to run the business, the kind of uh, characteristics they would like their business to have, all this needs to be planned beforehand. <laughs> then you have the phase of organizing the venture. The entrepreneur organizes all his resources, such as staff, money, and other available resources, while working towards the next phase of launching the business. And finally, in step four, we have the launch of the venture. The ultimate phase of entrepreneurial venture involves converting the plan into tangible actions that are aimed at deriving a profit from the planned and organized activities. So there you have it. The venture has now been launched. And let's look at the steps which come after the launch in order to keep the, the business um, flowing, the business going smoothly and um, the entrepreneurial activity turning a profit. So the next step, that is step five, involves the resources. It is necessary for an entrepreneur to look at their resources in a very uh, cost efficient manner so that they are able to, to plan ahead, they are able to gauge how much they would need. And this will also enable the venture to stay afloat long enough so that the activity may generate sizable revenues. So let, what are the resources that an, that an entrepreneur has to, uh, available to them? Well, of course, initially you would have the seed money where entrepreneurs would start a business and they would need an initial amount of, of uh, sorry, the term here uh, should be an initial amount of money, excess amount of business, uh, pardon the mistake, but an amount of money and this would be their first financial resource, that is the seed money. Next, you have venture funds. Entrepreneurs need venture capital for day-to-day -day running of the business and maintenance against the uncertain market forces. And thereafter, there has to be a growth capital. You must have heard um, in your previous studies about um, firms leveraging debt and equity. Well, in this case, an entrepreneur just tries to generate growth capital um, through different sources. And the motivation behind uh, coming up with growth capital is that when the entrepreneur needs to size up their venture by expanding the business, they would require growth capital in order to expand their market reach and presence, thus leading to an expanded output from the organization. This could just simply mean um, having additional stores of the entrepreneurial activity or uh, hiring more manpower, for instance. Step six involves the management. Now, as we know from uh, the previous management uh, education and the authors of, of management sciences, that management is the art of getting things done by others and through others. Uh, what does the management involve in entrepreneurship? Well, again, it involves planning. Planning is always a crucial step at many different um, at many different points of the life cycle of the entrepreneurship. And uh, planning, we need to look into the future. The entrepreneur would not be able to run the business consistently unless there is uh, proper planning. And that's the reason entrepreneurs need to first do management planning. Next, we have organizing. All the resources utilized or to be utilized need to be organized and managed efficiently. Now the important step of directing comes into play. Entrepreneurs have to manage the staffing process, motivating the employees, and also communicate their vision and expectation in the directing phase. And after the directing phase has been put into play, you have the aspect of controlling. And controlling means controlling the management processes whenever some processes need to be aligned with the entrepreneurial activity. And ultimately, we have step seven, and that is strategy, strategies. So strategizing. 
Developing and implementing strategies represent the last step of the entrepreneurial process. So what are these strategies and why are they needed? Well, strategies are required and they need to be correct and sound because when it comes to all processes, st best strategies enable a favorable competition. I mean, favorable for the entrepreneur himself. He can compete efficiently against his competitors. And it also necessitates a good way or a good strategy for running the entrepreneurial venture well into the future. So when, we, when an entrepreneur strategizes, what he or she essentially does is that they come up with the, they come up with plans, say for instance, a five-year plan of what they want their business to be, what they want it to expand into. And then once they have the strategy in place, they apply the resources towards those strategies and ultimately realize their goals in a set amount of time. So that was, uh, that was, what I had for a step-by-step -step approach to the entrepreneurial process. Now let's look at decision-making. Decision-making in entrepreneurship is or happens to be one of the most critical processes in an entrepreneurial firm. An entrepreneur will make decisions about everything. Uh, these may be small decisions, they are, which are, um, while some decisions are more influential uh, to the overall business process. But the smaller decisions without significant effect on the business as a whole are still decisions in themselves and they need to be taken by the entrepreneur himself. So the decision-making process is one of the most critical processes. Different types of processes exist in reality, but in general, they all have the same process. They all have the same purpose. And that is effective and efficient decision decisions that bring results to the business. So um, I will now look at the following steps and um, in what entails decision-making processes. So the first thing that an entrepreneur would need to do is he would need to recognize the problem, that is the gap. Now, what is the gap? The gap is necessarily, say for instance, you have the desired state of um, of the state of affairs where the entrepreneur is trying to gauge um, opportunity and you also have the the um, desired state and the existing state so you there is something which you want to improve and there is the way things are so the difference between these two states that is where we want to be and where we are at present is the gap or the problem and this gap is what the entrepreneur tries to solve through decision-making processes. The next step involves analyzing the problem. After you would find, uh, say, now we are looking at this um, from the narrative of ourselves being an entrepreneur. So try to picture or imagine yourself as an entrepreneur. And that is what uh, creates you, uh, puts you in the driving seat of decision-making. So the next thing would be analyzing the problem. After you find possible problems that require solutions, you can start with the analysis of already defined problems and how these problems impact on the achievements of your small business. In your analysis, you need to find causes and how the problem impacts your small business. If the impact of the problem is higher, also the importance of the problem will be high. Then you need to direct more energy and attention to, that, to the gap. The next step involves defining possible solutions. We have now reached the phase where we have identified the gap and now we need to come up with possible solutions by defining them clearly. Now, this is the step when the entrepreneur would need to start brainstorming all possible solutions for a given problem or problem that they want to achieve or solve. And for the most critical problems, you would have to analyze in the previous step and create, thereafter create possible solutions. The next thing to do is to analyze all the possible solutions. In this step, you will need to give the rankings of all possible solutions from the best ones at the top to the worst ones at the end. Now I'm not meaning the worst ones, but rather the less efficient ones would need to be placed at the bottom of the list. 
with regard to each problem that is discovered at the beginning of the decision making process. And when you come up with a preferential list and you come up with the best possible solution which you think is correct, um, it is always a good idea to implement the one which you feel is going to lead to most efficient results. Thereafter, we have selection of the best solution for the application. The final result from the decision making process is a selection of the best possible solution based on the organizing of um, solutions that are more preferred and less preferred um, towards the problem and uh, what you will implement as a solution for the given problem now just think about this and the answer to this question will ultimately be the decision that the entrepreneur needs to make and um, after this, after the solution has been selected we come into the next step that is implementing the decision in this phase the entrepreneur needs to implement the solution and check the results. Now, this is also crucial. Once the decision has been implemented, a check has to be placed on the results gained from implementing the decision in order to test and gauge if the specific solution has really solved the identified problem or not. So this would involve looking at the cash flow, or it would um, involve looking at the demand for the product or the service and uh, looking at how well it has improved from the past, whether it has improved in terms of performance or not. So what I've just spoken can also be uh, represented in the form of a diagram uh, of the decision making process. And here it is in front of you. So the decision making process involves a problem, finding the problem, and analyzing the problem. Then you have the solutions, coming up with solutions, defining possible solutions, and analyzing the different types of solutions based on how good they are. Uh, thereafter comes the decision, that is choosing the best solution to implement. And finally comes the implementation. And in the implementation phase, you have the process of implementation as well as controlling the implementation. So controlling the implementation again involves um, testing how well the problem has been solved, whether it has been solved or not after the new decision has been implemented. And there you have it, that is the decision-making process um, in, in a nutshell. Now let's look at uh, more um, varied and uh, more newer concepts in entrepreneurship. And that is the scientific approach to decision making in entrepreneurship. Now, recent studies in entrepreneur in uh, strategy and entrepreneurship. Um, basically, this is a, a definition by Novelli and Spina quite recently in 2021. And what they say is recent studies in strategy and entrepreneurship that provide insight on systematic decision-making approaches to entrepreneurial activities, take the view that firm performance improves when entrepreneurs deliberately follow a structured process. Now, the structured process is, is what they are referring to as the scientific approach, and we will look into this, delve into this much deeper in the coming slides. So prior literature has emphasized two different types of structured processes. Uh, that firms can employ when making decisions. A first stream of research emphasizes the benefits of a cognitive-based approach to decision-making. Now, this type of approach is centered on how the development of a theory, simple rules or mental representations of business problems can drive business innovation, performance heterogeneity, and superior strategy. Now, this is the first approach, which is cognitive based. And uh, the next approach or the next stream to this uh, scientific approach is a second stream of research emphasizes instead the importance of an evidence based approach to decision making, relying on systematic collection of evidence to guide subsequent action. Now, this approach, that is the second stream, focuses on developing predictions regarding the business and testing them, for instance, via experimentation in order to generate relevant feedback. Now, the crucial thing to do here is experimentation. 
and it also involves the systematic evaluation of the evidence that entrepreneurs gather. So you have two streams. One is the cognitive based, that is the first stream, and the second one is the evidence based stream. Now there is also something called a hybrid approach. Uh, and more recently, some authors have ad have advanced that cognitive and evidence based approaches can be complementary and mutually reinforcing. And this is the hybrid approach. Eisenhardt and Bingham underline the importance of combining thinking and doing and of a holistic approach to decision making that involves both a cognitive understanding of the playing field and action or learning via experimentation. McDonald and Eisenhardt in 2020 emphasized the benefits of testing assumptions underlying cognitive templates used by firms in the form of business models. And um, ultimately, Camufo and uh, his co-authors have emphasized how scientist rigor, that is the scientific approach, in the discovery process, which simultaneously involves a cognitive component, that is theory development and formulation of a hypothesis, and an evidence-based component, that is testing and evaluation of the evidence, can be successfully applied to entrepreneurial decision-making. Camufo and his co-authors call this the scientific approach to decision-making. And um, this is a very novel approach. And uh, let's look a little bit more deeper into this in the coming slides. So how does a scientific approach work? Uh, I've just uh, taken the liberty to um, exemplify this in the form of a um, business model. Firstly, we have an innovative firm that uh, intends to produce and sell vegetarian food. We will call this firm Pallet. If Pallet's founder, Felicia, was acting like a scientific entrepreneur, she would start with a cognitive approach to the problem, elaborating a theory of how her company could create value for customers. Now, Felicia's theory might be that vegetarian food will be increasingly popular because it represents a healthier, more sustainable choice, and it does not harm animal welfare. So this is a progressive thinking approach that Felicia has in her theory. But despite its advantages, vegetarian food might not be as appealing as it is often not tasty. Felicia would conclude that value can be generated by finding innovative ways of cooking vegetarian food to make it tastier. A theory might also posit that younger consumers could be the ideal uh, target as they care more about a healthier lifestyle and sustainability and were willing to pay a premium for tasty vegetarian food. Now, this is the, this is the, the theorizing that Felicia has. And let's look at how she would approach it from a scientific approach perspective. So as a scientific entrepreneur, Felicia would then combine the cognitive approach described so far with an evidence-based approach. And it would come, uh, it, she would be basically implementing uh, the hybrid approach, which was discussed by Camufo in the previous slide. Uh, here, Felicia would collect data to test the theory developed. And she would first derive a testable hypothesis from the broad theory. That is, one, her vegetarian food is as tasty as non-vegetarian equivalents. And two, Conditional on the first hypothesis being supported, it is more likely to be preferred by younger customers. So now she has developed two hypotheses um, using the scientific approach. To put these hypotheses to test, Felicia would then conduct a blind test of the first hypothesis. She could then sell her vegetarian food via pop-up stalls where customers can sample her food before purchase and observe through data collection who was more likely to purchase food after tasting it, whether the younger or the older customers. And based on the results obtained, she could then use these findings to evaluate what to do next. That is, for instance, whether to change the way the food is prepared or how to advertise the, pro the product. But as you can see, Felicia has a scientific theory in her mind. She has uh, come up with hypotheses, which uh, after theorizing that um, 
the food would be more appealing to the younger generation. And she goes on to test her uh, theory. So this is the scientific approach. And uh, it works out well because you can also use evidence to, you can also collect evidence to test whether the hypothesis are really working or not. And then finally successfully implement a good entrepreneurial model, business model. Um, so that's all for, um, for the scientific approach. Now let's look at a more upcoming, um, a more upcoming theme in entrepreneurship, and that is the green entrepreneur or the sustainable ecopreneur. Now, never before has there been such an opportunity and an imperative for innovation that meets the needs of citizens without damaging the planet's natural resource base. You must have uh, heard this definition, which is very similar to the definition of sustainability. In the same way, green entrepreneurship has the potential to be a major force in the overall transition to a more sustainable business paradigm. In a market-based economy, green entrepreneurs play a critical role in the eventual adoption of green business practices by the wider business community through the leading role that they provide to other firms. In contrast to the push factors of government regulation and stakeholder or lobby group pressure, by demonstrating economic benefits that come from being greener and more sustainable, ecopreneurs act as pull factors that entice other firms to proactively go green. And this is an exciting area of entrepreneurship with individuals developing business solutions that help model more sustainable solutions while addressing some of the planet's most pressing issues. Um, so let's look at a few case studies that, that implement um, green entrepreneurship. And uh, the one I came across and which I really uh, seem to prefer is, um, is this company in the US called Patagonia. Patagonia is a company international, internationally recognized for the design of innovative and environmentally um, sound outdoor clothing. Their business model raises major sums for environmental causes and their technological uh, innovation reduces the environmental impact of their products. So basically their production processes are, are, um, are technologically uh, innovative and uh, they reduce the strain on the environment as a, due to the production or manufacturing process. Patagonia also has an ongoing campaign called Big, Wild and Connected. And this is where it gets interesting. Big, Wild and Connected profiles different topics with stories in their catalogs, fundraising events, and public outreach. It was Chris Tompkins, a former CEO of Patagonia, who approached the company with a plan to start a nonprofit organization dedicated to buying, protecting, and restoring land in the Patagonia region. The company assisted with the NGO startup efforts using their creative services department to create and print their materials. The company also realized that if they could share profits, they could also supply time and muscle. The result was the Patagonia Employee Internship Program. Through the program, employees can leave their jobs at Patagonia for up to two months to work full-time for the environmental group of their choice. Patagonia continues to pay employees salaries and benefits while they're gone and the environmental group, that is any particular NGO in the area, gets the services of these Patagonia employees for free. So far, as of 2007, more than 350 employees have worked as interns for groups worldwide since the program, since the program has began, uh, was begun in the year 1993. So this is an innovative uh, venture, a green venture. Uh, thereafter, I would also like to, to direct your attention to green and blacks. Uh, who doesn't like chocolate? So in May, 2015, Cadbury Schweppes acquired the organic brand Green and Black, uh, which has now become the UK's leading supplier of organic chocolate. This company is a testament to the fact that consumers are willing to pay more for certain ethical products. And in this case, organic fair trade chocolate and are attracted to green companies. 
What is Green and Blacks, you may ask me? Green and Blacks was founded in 1991 by the journalist Josephine Fairley and her partner Craig Sams, an organic food specialist. They both were inspired by the taste of cocoa that they savored while on a holiday in Belize. Fairley, that is Josephine Fairley, was a chocoholic who had repeatedly returned from assignments abroad to complain that the dark chocolate she found in other countries was not readily available in the UK. So what did they do? They came up with a solution. They came up with an entrepreneurial activity. After deciding to make their own chocolate, the couple chose the name green to represent the organic nature of the product and black for the 70% cocoa solids it would contain. And it uh, did so well that today, um, green and blacks seems to have a 95% market share of organic chocolate in the UK. But that's not all. Green and Black's strategic decision was that rather than dominate the organic chocolate market, they would compete in the market as a chocolate in their own right, using organic as only one of the things which set them apart. So um, these are just a few examples, but there are many more and you can always look for them to inspire you and your next um, disruptive venture. Now, uh, let's look at potential areas of discussion and, and improvement. Now I'm going a little bit back in time to when Maslow had theorized um, um, the, the, the pyramid of needs. So in 1943, Maslow had pointed out Human motivation comes from the desire of individuals to satisfy their needs. That is Maslow's theory of needs. Maslow arranged these into a pyramid of needs consisting first of a broad base, which were just the basic physiological needs in, that were needs to satisfy hunger, thirst, and etc. cetera. Um, his theory stated that once satisfied, that is once the lower um, tier was satisfied, these needs were no longer seen to operate as primary motivators and people would then concentrate on the next need in the hierarchy, which are the needs for physical safety and protection. Moving up the, the pyramid, physical needs are followed by the need to belong. And thereafter the need for self-esteem followed by the need for personal growth, expression and development. So these are basically self-fulfillment and self-esteem. As individuals in a society progress up the pyramid, the society inevi inevitably progresses up too. And this is true for almost all societies. So then what are we really uh, focusing on here is the need to belong. And the need to belong is fulfilled by TV series like the popular TV show in the uh, late 90s and the early 2000s by the title of Friends. I'm sure many of you remember it. And members of the evolved society are concentrating in, in this, you know, on the next stage, that is self-realization. Now, many people in the top of the pyramid societies may think that fulfillment and happiness are rights that they can demand, um, as postulated by uh, Furedi in 2004, but that is not always the case. We also need to look at the feel-good factor now, how can the feel-good factor be explained is, for instance, if you feature conspicuously over-consuming, rich, happy, successful, uh, beautiful people breathing joyfully to pop music. Now, that is basically covering the need to belong. That is, people want to identify themselves with a higher lifestyle, a higher, um, a higher way of standard of living. And that is also moving, that is before moving on to the next stage of self-realization. Now, should this be true, then Maslow's theory can be used in a predictive fashion. And what it could be is, for example, certain genres of music that correspond to mid or low levels on Maslow's pyramid. For instance, the blues are unlikely to become a mainstream phenomena again. But when you have things like pop music and, you, and you're portraying a happy and rich culture, then naturally people are, are going to get gravitated towards uh, the feel good effect. And that would cover the need to belong, which is uh, very well recognized in Maslow's theory of needs. 
so can this be used um, as a can this be used in a predictive fashion in order to gauge what would be the next entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial opportunity available to an entrepreneur uh, can this feel good effect actually translate into a business venture i leave that to you and you can post it in the comments um now we also have potential areas of uh, discussion and improvement um from the business venture itself and according to bennett and chatterjee one way to increase the quality and quantity of entrepreneurial ventures would be to lower the cost of experimentation and this needs to be done at the very beginning of the entrepreneurial process how can this be done well we have incub business incubators we have um, the scientific approach we have experimentation and uh, through the scientific approach uh, which and that involves hypothesizing and data collection and finally implementing uh, crucial decisions but it could also in involve guidance from industry experts from academicians consulting with uh, with uh, uh, what you say business leaders and that could actually uh, reduce the cost of experimentation which um, which is a is an inevitable part of entrepreneurship an intervention intended to encourage systematic experimentation to support decision making within an observed time window could be helpful they underline the need for further work to be done devoted to identifying the ideal time window for programs targeted to entrepreneurial firms as well as the most effective design choices for the entrepreneurial design and strategy now um, let's look at this um, this activity here and um, but before that i think um, i think i would like to also first take you through the uh, take you through the poll so uh, can we please uh, have the poll okay the poll is launched okay um uh, so to all my dear participants i urge you to go through these two questions and uh, and answer what you feel is uh, the most appropriate um, option and then we will have a discussion on why it was selected uh, of course don't be afraid to to choose what you feel is correct because it is necessary that we will um provide the explanation and clarify things better uh for a brief moment i will uh, i will pause and thereafter we will have the explanations so uh, we are approaching the, the two minute mark and um, i think it would be a, a good idea to now discuss the the options selected by our participants um well um, 
So for the first, uh, for the first question, that is the function performed by an entrepreneur is called. And um, I'm happy to notice that um, 65% of um, the participants have chosen entrepreneurship. And uh, this is the correct, um, this is the correct option because uh, this was also discussed at the very, in the beginning slides. But there are also a few, uh, a few of uh, the participants who have chosen um, the description as enterprise um, and also management. Now, um, let me take you through as to why it is uh, function is to be termed as entrepreneurship and not any other term. So um, now I will um, share the screen towards um, the explanations that I have. Right. So uh, can you see, can you see the, can everyone see the short explanation which I put up on the screen? We can see it. Okay, yes. So the reason why um, entrepreneurship needs to be selected as the correct option is the word entrepreneur originates from a 13th century French word that is entrepreneur, meaning to do something or to undertake. And basically what an entrepreneur does is he, he or she undertakes to do something that is the business venture. And um, historically, that is by the 16th century, now an entrepreneur was being used to refer to someone who undertakes a business venture. The first academic use of the word was most likely in 1730, as we have already seen by Richard Cantillon. And uh, thereafter, the word or uh, the word entrepreneur was popularized by Jean Baptiste Say, and uh, thereafter by John Stuart Mill. So it definitely needs to be the option entrepreneurship is correct, and that needs to be selected uh, every time thereafter. Um, now moving on to the next uh, to the next uh, question, and that is, uh, entrepreneur is a person or a group of persons who bears what? And um, many of uh, the participants uh, have chosen uh, correctly, and that is risk, uh, which uh, which would be the correct option. Uh, why would it be risk and not uh, certainty? Well, um, entrepreneurship is not about certainty. If you want certainty, then you have to basically go for a regular nine to five. But entrepreneurship involves taking risk and moderating the risk in order to run a profit, which uh, would be exponentially higher than, than having certainty. And the reason for this is that... Um, when an entrepreneur seeks a high profit, the risk is usually higher. And risk is the, is the chance of failure or loss. So basically you have the balance between risk and reward. And uh, risk taking has often, uh, has often been related to potential rewards. So for instance, the more money that a person invests in a business, the more financial risk the person is taking because he or she has more money to lose but the returns are going to be um, proportionally higher. So that is why the correct option uh, to the question is risk. Um, now, um, now that we are, uh, we are concluded with the poll, um, I thank you all for participating. And uh, now I would like to direct your attention to a brainstorming session. And uh, that is here in this slide. So, I'm sure that you all can see the key phrases and I would like you to select the key phrases which you as participants feel are relevant to coming up with a decision uh, with a definition that best describes entrepreneurial decision making. So we have the key phrases like for instance, what do entrepreneurs do? Entrepreneurs act then uh, what is the kind of environment? The environment is uncertain. What are the factors? There are different factors. Uh, who plays a role? Naturally, the entrepreneur plays a role. 
So these are the key phrases. And what I urge you to do is just to think in your mind, which would be the most relevant. Like for instance, at the end you have at 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22, you have the key phrases that is eliminate, collaborate, divulge, represent, share. Do you think that these phrases are actually going to be relevant to um, entrepreneurship and to entrepreneurial decision making? So uh, just think about it that how you're going to, um, how you're going to apply these different phrases in coming up or composing a definition that best describes entrepreneurial decision making. And take a moment, and then after I will reveal to you how the how the uh, the effect of each phrase would help in in uh, coming up with the definition. So, uh, my dear participants, if you have um, if you have uh, sufficient um, time to discuss, um, I'm getting a bit of noise from the microphone. Uh, could, could the participants kindly mute their microphones? Okay. Uh, so now um, we have the key phrases, and I'm sure you all had the time to at least go through. Um, the, the ones which you consider are most relevant. Now I will reveal to you the ones which are relevant to the definition and the ones which are not, and then we will come up with a, a very relevant definition. So entrepreneurs act relevant, uncertain environment also. Different factors, of course, there are different factors to this. And these different factors would play a role. You have organizational development, market response being important here, um, customers' behavior being an important factor, competition threat, that is the threat from the competition also being an important factor, governmental regulations also being important, suppliers, investors, you need investors for generating venture capital. Then you have impact on the organization. What is this? Let's look at uh, further in detail in the definition. Provide provision of information. Let's look, look into that as well. Thereafter, we have opportunities and threats, also relevant. Decisions on a strategic level. Cope with the challenges. Determine the success. Now, if you thought that eliminate was important or, rele or relevant, that would not be correct. Collaborate, also not relevant. Divulge, not relevant to the definition. Represent, not relevant. And finally, share, not relevant. So let's look at the definition after incorporating all these key phrases that we uh, can come up with in the most efficient manner. And that is this one. And it reads, entrepreneurs act in an uncertain environment where different factors may play a role in the decision-making process. Organizational developments based on market response like customers' behavior, competition threat, governmental regulations, suppliers, investors, etc., have an impact on the organization. All decision-making process will lead to opportunities and threats towards the company. Based on this information, the entrepreneur must take decisions on a strategic level to cope with the challenges and to determine the success of the strategic decision. Now, as you can see, the phrases have been incorporated, the key phrases, and the others which are not relevant were left out. And I also took the liberty to refer to two, um, uh, two books in, uh, to help me come up with this definition. And um, I hope that it has been um, informative for you in a way that 
um, it helps you to come up with a better understanding of what the decision making process entails in entrepreneurial uh, activity uh, so that uh, should um, actually uh, conclude the, the presentation um, i would also like to um, share with you that the references for all, all the uh, works that i have um, referred to are um, cited here in the same presentation and in case you are looking for a more in-depth um, uh, in depth um, material, you can certainly uh, refer to these uh, citations and uh, go to the relevant um, works and read on further. I would also urge you to go through the recommended uh, reading material that is that will be put up in the uh, virtual platform. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to thank you um, immensely for your attention and uh, for for also you know uh, taking the time to to uh, to remain present and um, now I would like to um, take your questions and also to understand better uh, what you feel is the best approach to entrepreneurship and the decision making. Uh, okay. So, would uh, we have one student that uh, has raised his hand? Can you okay. please uh, stop sharing so that uh, we see yeah. uh, a full view yeah. of yourself? Yes. Good. So, uh, Mr. Firankor, the uh, show, would you like to um, make your question? Pose your question. Yes, uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Teshom. Uh, what would you like to, um, to ask me or comment? Uh, please go ahead. Uh, perhaps uh, he needs more time. Yes. Uh, let's look at the comments. Um, do we have any questions in the chat? We have Mr. Mancini. Uh, that uh, would like to say something to ask yes. a question. I, I, think, oh. I was looking for the chat. Okay. Okay. Do we have any question? There is no question in the chat. Well, I would I would very much appreciate if uh, you had questions because uh, that helps me to improve more on my understanding of the subject. I have one question. Oh, yes, certainly. <laughs> you mentioned that um, uh, uh, an entrepreneur uh, assumes a risk. OK, so this risk is economic. What are the, the, the aspects of the risk? Only economic? Is it uh, uh, something else besides uh, financial? Well, I can assure you that it is not emotional risk. <laughs> You see, um, when I was going through the, the risk and rewards um, equations for, uh, I mean, that are discussed in scientific papers, what I realized was that um, risk, although they are calculated, are often unforeseen. Now, you may be able to, to foresee um, risk that are financial by gauging the market, by looking at performance of competitors, by looking at uh, demand and supply mechanisms. But there are some risks which are outside the framework of financial risk, but they have a direct impact on, the, on, on taking uh, monetary risk. So what are these risks? Well, for instance, you could say that uh, you have risk in the form of uh, a certain workforce going on strike. 
And uh, if this workforce happens to be of the supplier, and this supplier is the one supplying the, the raw materials to your entrepreneurial business or activity, then this is a risk you're not able to foresee, but you have to assume that you always keep more than two suppliers to, um, to depend on one or the other in case you have a worker's strike. Or you have things like global recession and decline in exports or decline in imports. So then again, that would be a supply chain risk. And that needs to, that has a direct impact on the financial risk, but it cannot be foreseen or perceived until it actually happens. So how to gauge for this is to come up with a safety net. And this safety net involves coming up with more than one or two suppliers in the B2B marketplace, or coming up with more than one or two advisors or uh, more than one or two um, uh, friends of your business. And what this helps to do is that you can always have dependability. And dependability should always be understood as a way for an entrepreneur to ensure consistency of the business venture. And that is why risk cannot only be financial, then they are related to finance or so they're related to money, but they can come from, a, from very different sources. And these sources uh, cannot be sometimes foreseen. So to answer your question, there are other risks, but um, I'm sure that um, the entrepreneur, a good entrepreneur always takes the scientific approach and prepares or uh, braces for these risks. Okay, th therefore he, 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 he should uh, make, let's say some uh, risk plan or uh, risk management. Uh, yes. Okay. Of course, the risk, risk, man risk management um, is a key concept, uh, which is part of implementing the decisions. And um, as you might have, you are aware, um, an entrepreneur takes many decisions during the course of the day. And some of these decisions have a risk in themselves. So is there a safety plan always? Well, it's not always possible. But what an entrepreneur can do is he can take one decision and keep another decision just in case the first, the first risk uh, comes up. So in case he faces a risk in the first time, he can always come up with a, a safety net or a safety plan to fall back on. And this would help to, to mitigate any potential loss to the business. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for your question. I think we have um, a comment in the chat uh, from, um, from a participant. So um, it says, I will just read it out for the benefit of everyone. Uh, can we observe any patterns or differences among different types of entrepreneurship? That is startup, youth, spin-off, deep tech high, uh, tech entrepreneurship. Well, the the basic principles would always remain the same. Uh, there are differences in the formats and the platforms being used, but the ultimate pattern of uh, entrepreneurship is uh, implement is to um, decide. The entrepreneur has to come up with um, an analysis. Then he has to decide what he's going to do. Then he's going to implement it, and after implementing, he's going to control for it. So these, these basic principles never uh, diverge from one another, and they are common to almost all forms of entrepreneurship. The only thing is that the platforms, like for instance, earlier we did not have um, social media to, to uh, promote a kind of online entrepreneurship. But nowadays it's possible through Facebook advertising and um, also through the online uh, websites for uh, trade and commerce. And also Bitcoin has taken off really well. So it enables uh, digital payments through uh, digital currencies. But this is, these are the only things which um, are change and change is always constant. But what doesn't change in entrepreneurship are the principles because decisions cannot be automated or they cannot be automated to a certain extent. You always have the human touch. And these decisions would always be based on the 
person who implements them who takes them and the person who implements them would always have to um, first analyze the the problem gap and subsequently the implementation and the control would take take place so from my perspective um, of course there are papers which uh, would uh, say otherwise but from my perspective and understanding uh, the the base um, what do you see the basic principles always continue to be the same but the format of the platform or of the the kind of um, the kind of business venture could change the characteristics a little bit but this does not change the the broader principles of entrepreneurship i hope that uh, uh, sheds light on your uh, on your query um, do we have any more uh, participants who would like to uh, discuss um, what you say through through voice through the microphone uh, yes uh, this time i lowered it uh, i raised the hand on purpose so, yes mr um, man can you tell me is a comment about your your previous statement i would say that uh, uh, the emotional risk is uh, is definitely present uh, for an entrepreneur uh, actually i would say uh, the 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 pressure under which an entrepreneur is uh, constantly operating is maybe a factor that is not uh, taken into account uh, sufficiently. Because in my experience as an entrepreneur, uh, that is actually one of the uh, biggest risks that I've taken uh, if I compare to my experience in working as an employee. Uh, as an employee, I have a sort of uh, safety nets uh, from the employer, the social security, and so on. And as an entrepreneur who starts a business from scratch, uh, I'm risking uh, financially, I'm risking uh, uh, also the, uh, uh, all, all the time I put in the business that might fail. And the pressure is, in my, in my experience, and also in the experience of the entrepreneurs that I know, is uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, burden uh, on my shoulders. I, I respect that um, I'm in the company of um, an entrepreneur himself. And uh, I wish you all the best with your, with your business venture. And I hope that you scale new heights. Uh, you spoke about emotional risk and that it is assumed um, um, to be, it is not assumed to be an important aspect. Um, see, I have not completely negated emotional risk as not being present. What I said is, besides financial risk, there are unforeseen risks which are not, um, which are not always perceived as uh, crucial for the business. Uh, because these could also be in the realm of smaller decisions. And while you have, while you always have the urge not to, uh, not to fail or for your business venture, I mean, not to uh, fail, what, what happens is the motivation of, um, of continuing with your emotional um, risk is that you cannot let that transpire into the finances. I mean, you cannot be you cannot be wagering your your emotional risk uh, into the finances. You have to you have to be good with how well you gauge your your finances, how well you project your uh, your uh, what you say your five year plans. You have to be able to take all these things into account in an objective manner, and this objective manner sometimes may not have the place for emotional risk of course it is it is a pressure and, and uh, it is uh, it is something that is very natural a uh, human tendency but think about it could that actually could uh, could the emotional risk translate into numbers i would say so uh, there are new trends in uh, psychology that are uh, making uh some measurements of, of psychological behavior quite uh, quantitative. Uh, I was working in the Institute, Institute for Advanced Study of the University of Amsterdam for some time. Okay. And uh, one of the collaboration we had, uh, we, explore, we were exploring in the terms of an holistic approach to uh, different uh, problems, uh, working on complex systems, was actually with the psychology department and with the 
uh, other humanistic uh, humanistic institutes. So I would say uh, that actually there is a trend, maybe still quite new, but uh, it's definitely worth looking into it because indeed uh, it is, as you say, it is important uh, so far, uh, maybe up to this point was not well, um, it was not easy to quantify it, but there are efforts and, and they are growing in this direction. And I think it's important to, when you analyze a new uh, business venture, uh, it's, it would be actually uh, now a competitive advantage to uh, uh, take into account also the psychological aspect in a quantitative way. Yes, of course, I, I, I agree with you. And um, it's good to know that uh, you are at the forefront of um, psychological research. Um, in fact, one of my favorite topics uh, in organizational behavior has been emotional intelligence. And you must have come across it through the first book written by Daniel Goldman. Uh, have, you, have you come across the concept of emotional intelligence? Uh, well, I mean, I, I heard the, the concept. I'm not working in the domain, but uh, okay. for example, I can put the, the link to the um, uh, person that I was uh, working with just okay. in case. Okay. Uh, I mean, it might be interesting for you to connect. Uh, certainly, certainly. And I'm sure that even the... Um, even the I, I put it in the chat. Okay, thank you for sharing. I'm sure the participants would be uh, also interested, as am I. Um, you know, I came across the concept of emotional intelligence, and um, this was way back in the year 2016. And at that time, one thing I learned is that a leader, and in this case, every entrepreneur is a leader, uh, is that um, needs to, a leader needs to apply the most appropriate emotional responses to the uh, to the interactions he's going to face or he's facing at present at the workplace. And this involves um, eliciting the right kind of uh, words, expressions, and body language in responding to work-related interactions. So what Daniel Goldman says is that some people are more than natural at it, and some people are, have to actually synthesize a kind of emotional intelligence aspect. Uh, of course, emotional intelligence um, may not always coincide with intelligence quotient uh, um, uh, as you know the IQ. EQ and emotional quotient and intelligence quotient may not always coincide. But one thing is for certain here is that how a person carries himself, how an entrepreneur carries himself, uh, and portrays himself as a leader uh, has a lot to do with how well the, the business venture will go ahead, because um, this would entail, you know, um, getting sending the right kind of of, um, of psychological signals to investors, to uh, to banking institutions, and even to potential customers. Because once you once the kind of emotional response is is why hardwired into the ethos of the company or the business, then naturally everyone would, everyone would be drawn to a business that is more emotionally inclined. And of course you're right that there is a risk, but if there is a risk, then there is also a reward. So, you know, it is, it is always up to the, it is always up to the, the charisma of the entrepreneur to navigate through this. Of course, you cannot navigate through, you cannot always navigate through the behavior of how you're going to interact with other people and the, the behavior you get back. So this involves a kind of um, a charisma which you have inherently and also how well you apply your own autonomy to deal with the issue. So uh, are, you, are you able to, to actually perceive where I'm getting at? Uh, sorry, I didn't get your question. No, no. Are, are you able to perceive that uh, an emotional and the emotional risk aspect can actually be harnessed through the emotion, through the responses and the inherent nature of the entrepreneur as a leader? So it is always up to the leader to 
to mitigate the emotional risk by by directing his energies and activities towards the more important um, aspects of the entrepreneurial venture sure sure but like in in the context of uh, kind of let's say uh, doing a quantitative analysis of uh, of a new venture uh, i would say uh, looking at the i don't know i mean this is my opinion like looking at the emotional risk uh, of a certain uh, setup of the new venture eh? because it depends also who is the entrepreneur does he does the entrepreneur in a certain country have uh, enough support uh, from the country is he risk how much he is risking personally how much uh, uh, like as you say, the, the, the charisma or the leadership uh, skill of the entrepreneur, uh, how much pressure can, uh, can, can, can take. So I don't know. I think, I think this is an aspect that uh, should be investigated further. In, in it, is, it, is def- it is definitely worth looking into um, uh, from a research perspective. But uh, in, in modern day business, from what my experience has shown in consulting with uh, with uh, different entrepreneurial firms in my locale, what I've understood is that if you need um, if you need the angel investors to invest in your in your venture, and I'm sure you have seen Shark Tank, right? We all have seen Shark Tank. So uh, what I've come to notice is that the the people who want to invest in in entrepreneurial activities actually want to see a very consistent and stable-minded approach of the entrepreneur. And if you use a term, and I'm being very uh, candid about it, if you use a term such as emotional risk, then they would naturally shy away from investing in your venture because um, they want to look at stability of the, and returns, the stability of their returns. And if they find that you're going to you know, decide uh, through the heart rather than through the mind or through numbers, then it would naturally make the investor apprehensive. This is what my personal experience has shown me. But this is not what I'm saying. It's not uh, about uh, making decision with the heart. Mm-hmm. Quite the contrary. It's, okay. it's taking into account the psychological uh, pressure that the entrepreneur has to go through. Um, I would say negating its existence uh, is, uh, um, is, uh, is a wish maybe of the investor, but uh, is, is, a, is a false wish. I mean, any entrepreneur will, uh, will be under a lot of pressure and not taking into account as an investor, I think is not a smart idea. Then it might be that there is not yet the culture and maybe emotional risk is the wrong term. Uh, if, uh, if, this is, uh, if this emotion comes with the... Uh, um, with the with kind of stigma attached to it, then mm-hmm. change the term. But then the fact remains, like uh, the the not taking into account the fact that any entrepreneur will face a certain amount of uh, psychological pressure mm-hmm. uh, when taking decision. Why why uh, people make wrong decision? People make wrong decision all the time. Uh, yeah. If at, at all levels, uh, look at what's happening now in, uh, in Ukraine. That was a bad decision, taken under pressure probably. But if no one is measuring the this kind of aspects that are part of the decision making, decision making is is always done by a person, and the person is never a machine. Is always a person that has that takes decision under pressure. And the decision and the pressure is also emotional or psychological, as you wish. Yes, of course. But anyway, I think, I think the motivation. Think... Sorry, the motivation is always uh, emotional. I mean, at least to a certain extent. Uh, do you? I'm sorry to cut you in between, but uh, do you mind um, exemplifying it for me so that we could have a better understanding for our participants? What is the actual? Um, emotional uh, risk that you have faced in your venture well i mean i, I don't know if I, if i would if i want to call it emotional risk but like every time uh, i mean compared to working as an entrepreneur and working as a person as a like an employee 
uh, has a completely different uh, impact on uh, the like on the mental uh, stability of, of a person. And I've seen it in myself. I've seen it in the other entrepreneurs that I work with. You are, not, you have, you are more responsible as an entrepreneur. You are directing the whole, uh, and, and this responsibility, uh, unless you are really, you don't care about your investors and you don't care about your employees and you don't care about anybody, then it, it, can, it comes with the weight. Uh, the weight of responsibility of being responsible for the investors who give you money for the employees that uh, put their trust in your in your uh, in your company i think it, it's uh, it's just harder and then depending on certain situations that can be uh, as you say there is a risk with the with the contractor there is a risk with the uh, like the 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 the, the social economic uh, situation of, of the country or uh, of the of the markets. In the end, the responsible person is more under pressure. I mean, there is no specific uh, thing, but these yeah. sometimes this, this pressure, if it's too much and it's not accounted for, uh, it, it can lead to bad decision making. And not every a, a entrepreneur starts from the same. Uh, uh, as the same resilience or the, the condition in which the business is uh, started are not the same. If, if I have, if I'm a very, uh, if I have a, a safety net of, uh, I don't know, in, good investors, sometimes you have investors in the company, not all investors are the same. You can have an investor that gave you money, but has no connection to the market, has no connection to the business, cannot advise you. Uh, or you, you cannot go to the investor for uh, to to uh, resolve uh, um, a critical situation in which the company can be because it's just an investor who gave you money but has no understanding of the market. It's a different from someone who has a, a different investor, an investor who is quali qualified uh, and who has experience in the market, who has seen uh, other critical situation and can maybe. Uh, also help you uh, uh, resolve the problem. I think this is a very different situation. And if I would have to invest in a company, I would say I would like to know uh, where the entrepreneur stands in this in this uh, uh, in this framework. Also, in the decision making that he's going to take. I don't know. It, it, I is, it is yes. Uh, thank you for sharing your. Um, your, what do you say, perspective. I, I appreciate and respect um, your personal experience and uh, you have been generous enough to explain it to us. Uh, I actually uh, want to read out a, a small comment by Sheldon uh, and uh, he's, he or she, sorry, um, by Sheldon uh, Ajinji. I'm sorry if I got your name pronunciation incorrect. Um, they say that emotional risk is important, but not vital to strategic decisions. So, um, of course, you know, we have two categories of risk and two categories of decisions. And um, we, need, we need to balance it as, entre as entrepreneurs, we need to balance it. And uh, hopefully, you know, as research progresses, um, there will be a possibility to, to come up with a very balanced approach where we do not actually have to face the fears or the apprehensions of our businesses not taking off um, in the right direction or the business is not progressing as expected. So it would be nice to live in a society where uh, everything can be um, predictable, but uh, it is not always the case and we need to, uh, we need to brace for that. So, uh, with those few words, I would like to also uh, thank Mr. Mancini, but, uh, you know, there are some final nuances of entrepreneurship that cannot always be foreseen, as I've said, and without these, um, without our safety nets or safety harnesses, uh, the foresight uh, cannot always, you know, s serve as good predictors because the factors of the world keep on uh, changing for entrepreneurs. Okay. Um, anyone else would like to um, have a query or a chat? Okay. Um, we have one question that was posed 10 minutes ago. 
uh, how do you ensure that you don't lose authenticity then? It was when you were at, um, saying about um, uh, emotional intelligence, but I'm okay. not sure why. Uh, if you can answer in one minute, otherwise we can... Uh, yeah, well, actually, um, in order, I think this was much prior to that, much prior to uh, speaking about emotional intelligence, but um, it would be nice if, if I could have a follow up to this uh, to the question. But in terms of authenticity, every entrepreneurial activity is always authentic. And uh, because the decision, no two decisions uh, by two different entrepreneurs can ever be the same. It has different uh, connotations and it has different outcomes. So authenticity is part of the ethos of entrepreneurship. And um, you would never lose authenticity if you are um, if you are applying your entrepreneurial venture in the way that you want it to go, and in the way that evidence has uh, demonstrated. So one of the best ways not to lose authenticity is to first of all have a scientific based approach um, that is by coinciding the evidence based approach and the cognitive based approach, and thereafter by coming to the hybrid approach suggested by Camo4 and uh, gauging what is the best way to for the direction that your entrepreneurship will take. And there are for taking decisions that would ensure uh, uh, you don't lose the authenticity of your venture by trying to differentiate yourself from competitors. And you can only differentiate yourself from competitors when you have the the know-how of what, where the market stands, what the consumers want, and what the competitors are doing at present, so that you can actually um, you can actually stand out in a way. Okay. okay. Um, besides that, um, I would just um, you know like to sum up in in one uh, sentence. Um, what is the what do you say? what I feel entrepreneurship entails. And um, so here we have it. Yeah, so, so basically to me, uh, I will go in the uh, quote the words of uh, Steve Case. He's the co-founder of AOL. And his advice is, you shouldn't focus on why you can't do something, which is what most people do. You should focus on why perhaps you can and be one of those exceptions. So with regards to the query about authenticity, I think it is always necessary to focus on what uh, most people cannot do and what you can actually do and try to be one of those exceptions and that would ensure that you remain authentic. And even Steve Case agrees. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Mr. Pinto, thank you for a lot for this very interesting and comprehensive lecture. Before closing this session, please let me remind everyone that next week's lecture is on Monday, not Wednesday, Monday, May 23rd at 10 a.m. Our next lecturer, Professor Karina Shop, Professor in Business Administration uh, at TU Barcademy Freiburg, will give us an insight on entrepreneurship and sustainability reporting. We are looking forward to learn more on the subject. Thanks everyone for your participation and have a nice rest of the day. Goodbye everyone. Thank you, Mr. Peter again. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye.